Good evening. Thank you for coming. The topic this night, this evening, is a uh, continuation of the topic we had last week about success, and um, we're going to continue. Success to most people is money. Uh, that's basically what it is. Not necessarily the key, but most of us look at our net worth, and that's uh, it's hard for a person to tell you he's poor and he's successful, but it could be, as we talked about last week. But where does this money, is, is it a blessing? Is it a curse? Does it come from God as a blessing, or does it come from the devil as a sense of uh, a temptation, uh, a fork in the road to take you in the wrong direction? The question is, which one? So, um, it's interesting. Uh, they tell the story of Alexander the Great and his conquest of the world. He came to the uh, land of the Amazons. And uh, before he went to battle, they sent out a message to him and they said, why fight with us? We're women. If you beat us, you, all you beat were women. And if we beat you, imagine trying to live that down. So why don't we just make peace? And Alexander accepted that. And before he left, the, he got gifts. And one of the gifts they gave him is they knew what he was, he was looking for miraculous things in the world. And they sh told him if he followed this river, it would take him to the Garden of Eden, Gan Eden. And so he followed the river. And sure enough, he, the river ended, according to the legend, at the Garden of Eden. And there stood the angel, fiery angel with a sword, protecting the gate. And Alexander dismounted and went up to the angel and asked to be able to pass through. And the angel says, no one passes through these gates. And Alexander says, but I'm Alexander the Great. How can I have come so far and not receive something? And the angel said, that request is true. And he said, I'll give you a gift. And he gave him an orb a round ball. And Alexander looked at it and he said, that's it? And the angel said to him, this round ball is heavier than all the wealth that you have. He says, really? He said, yes. He said, when you get back to your palace, take all the gold in your treasury, all your riches, put it on one side of the scale, you'll see this ball is heavier than everything. He was very amused, put it in his pouch, wound up back at his palace, and he took a sack of gold, because, I mean, he could feel what it weighed, and put a sack of gold onto the scale, and the ball was heavier. Amazing. And he put another sack and another sack. He actually emptied out his treasury, and it didn't budge. The round ball was heavier than all of the riches that he put on the other side of the scale. Now he was very interested. What could it be? So he called all of his wise men, Tell, tell him what it was. No one could figure it out. So he called the sages of the Jews. And he asked them. And they said to him, what the round ball is, is a human eye. He says, a human eye? They said, yes. As long as a man is, they said, they can, he said, can you prove it? They said, yeah. Take all the riches off and put some dust on the other side, dirt. And you'll find that the dirt will weigh more than the ball. Now, this was very entertaining. Took all the gold off and riches, put some dirt, boom. It was heavier than the ball. He said, what's that about? He said, because as long as a man's alive, no matter how much money he has, it's not enough for his eye. He wants more. The Gemara in Baba Metziah says, if a person has 100, he wants 200. If he has 200, he wants 400. Insatiable. So therefore, but when you put dirt, when he dies, then... He's satisfied. He no longer can have any more. The eye is closed. As we know, a baby is born with its grasping, its fist clenched. It's going to take everything. When a person dies, his hands are open. You leave this, come in this world with nothing, you leave with nothing. But we still have this desire to, to, to collect gold, riches. It's interesting that Abram Ravino minted a coin. And on the coin, on one side he had a young man and a young woman signifying some say that it was Yitzchak and Rivka, and on the other side, an old man and an old woman, signifying himself and Sarah. But others say the reason for that is, is because most desires as you get older diminish, but not the desire for gold, for money. 
That's the same whether you're young and old. It never leaves. So it becomes a great temptation. So it's interesting that uh, there was a rabbi who said that poverty is the most precious gift of all. It can't be bought with all the money in the world. That when a person is poor, he believes in God. When a person becomes wealthy, then many times his whole demeanor, his whole, his whole attitude towards God becomes different. They tell the story of the uh, Opta Rebbe, uh, Rebbe Abin Yeshua Heschel of Opt. It's called the O of Yisrael, the lover of Jews. There was a man who had a reputation for taking in guests. And he wasn't a wealthy person, but he was, he was, he was famous for this. And he decided to go see the man. And he went incognito. And when he knocked on the door, the man answered the door himself, very cordially invited him in to have a meal. He was dressed as a beggar. And there were other people there as well. And he watched the man as he prepared the meal. And as he was setting the table, he was setting it with wood and silverware and, and cups, wood. And he could hear him saying under his breath, Dear God, forgive me, these are princes. And they should have fine silver and china. But this is all I have. Let it be for them to such. And then when he was serving the meal, he was serving potatoes. And again, he could hear him under his breath saying to God, Dear God, forgive me. These are prince princes. They should have fat, fat goose and uh, all kinds of meats, special things, del delicacies. But all I have is potatoes. Let it be in their tongues as if I gave them that. And then he asked, he asked the Opta Rebbe if he wanted to spend the night. And he said yes. And he put out boards and straw and rags. And as he was doing that, again, he said, forgive me, dear God. These are princes. They should be sleeping on, 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 on fine linens and goose down pillows. Let this be for them as such. And the Opta Rebbe was very, very impressed. And when he left, he gave him a blessing. He said that you should be able to do what you're doing now in wealth instead of in poverty. And some time later, the man became fabulously wealthy, and he had a mansion, and all of a sudden his whole demeanor changed, and his door was locked, and his butler was told to not let any poor people in to chase them away. When the Opti Rebbe heard this, he found it very hard to believe, and before he did anything, he went to see the man himself. And he knocked on the door, and the butler answered and said, be, you know, leave quickly. My master doesn't like to see beggars. He walked past him and he said, tell him the Opta Rebbe is here. And he went into his study and he stood by the window. And the rich man came in and saw the Opta Rebbe and was impressed that the Rebbe came to see him. And the Opta Rebbe is looking out the window and the rich man's looking into a mirror and he's curling his handlebar mustache, dressed very elegantly. And the Opta Rebbe said to him, it's very strange. I look through the window and I see people walking by. And you look in the mirror and all you see is yourself. Very strange. And this now rich man kind of chuckled and he said, it's very simple. This has silver behind it. Yours is clear. That's why you don't see anything other than what's on the other, you know, people passing by. That's how I can see myself. And the Opta Rebbe said, exactly. Before I gave you the silver, you saw other people. Once I gave you the silver, all you see is yourself. He said, I have come to take away your wealth. It came because of my blessing. And again, the man begged him for forgiveness and said he would change. But that's many times people talk about the fact that if only I had money, what I would do. People, especially when they see other people, they want to spend your money. And they think that they would put their hand in their pocket. It's not so simple. In fact, there's a prayer that we say, um, it's not necessarily said by Lubavitch, but that we do in our shul, but definitely by uh, Ashkenaz. It's called Yehi Rosa, when you bless the new moon. Very quickly it says, May it be your will, God our God, God of our fathers, to renew this coming month for us for goodness and blessing. Grant us long life and then a life of peace, a life of goodness, a life of blessing, a life of sustenance, a life of bodily vigor, a life in which there is fear of heaven and fear of sin. And then it goes on, a life of prosperity and honor, wealth. And then again it repeats fear of heaven. So the fear of heaven is mentioned twice. Once before the blessing of wealth and once afterwards. 
Because once a person becomes wealthy, he needs an extra measure of fear of heaven. Because with wealth, rich people, you know, when there's a Cossack knocking at your door, the idea of God and the Messiah coming sound great. When you have a big house and you got a nice car in the driveway and you got money in your bank account, if the Messiah calls, you're lucky if you pick up the phone. If you do, you're going to put him on hold. There's no rush. Things are good. So people, money, the question becomes, is money good? Does it come from, the, from God or from the devil? And the truth is, it's not so simple. There, are, there is a blessing in wealth. We all ask for it. In fact, most people's prayers are for wealth. But for the most part, we don't receive reward in this word, world. The only thing you can get reward for in this world, there are some mitzvahs, if you can be punished for it, you can get reward for it. But most of the mitzvahs that we do are sent to our Swiss bank account, so to speak, in the next world. In the next world, all we take is receipts, things that you've done mitzvahs for in this world. The two things you can get reward for is what we call hitter mitzvah, spending that extra money to beautify a mitzvah. And even more important, which is really connected, is the enthusiasm that you show when you do a mitzvah. That's worth something that God will pay you in this world for. And we know that just like it says in Pirkei Avos, mitzvah gorera mitzvah. One mitzvah brings on another mitzvah. So what does that mean? That, that, so God doesn't really pay you when you do a mitzvah. What he does is he gives you an opportunity to do more mitzvahs. Where do we see this? In the Torah, in Devorim, in Kiseise, in the Sedra, in that portion, we talk about Shluch HaKan, sending away the mother bird. It says that after you do that, you'll have long life. The next portion talks about building a house. So once you've sent away the mother bird, now you have the mitzvah of building a house, and all the mitzvahs that come with it, the mezuzah, and all that we do by building a house. And then the mitzvah of making a roof, a fence around your roof. And then from there, the mitzvah of planting a field and all the mitzvahs that go with that. And then a vineyard and then clothing. So what happens is one mitzvah brings on another mitzvah. So the way that God pays you with having a mitzvah is by giving you the opportunity to do more. And it's interesting that the, 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 the temptation of money, even Abraham, Abraham Ravino, when he, when he won his battle over the four kings, and he told the king of Sodom that he wouldn't take a shoelace or a, or a thread from him, he made a vow that he wouldn't do it. Because the temptation of money, that there was a rabbi that every time he would touch money, he would wash his hands because of the impurity. But the truth is, it doesn't have to be a negative. It's a blessing when a person uses it as such. It's really something that's neutral. But what does the devil do with it? He wants a person to be successful. Because you'll find the successful people find it hard to come to shul, hard to, hard to, to uh, keep Shabbos. The, the, you know, I always tell people, if you're not doing any business, open up a Gemara and start learning. And I'm sure Satan will make sure you're not going to sit and learn. And that becomes the key. So people who are wealthy many times are slaves in gilded cages. They don't realize it. And what the devil has done is bought them off. And a person has to be careful that when you become wealthy, that you use it in a proper way and still continue to learn, still continue to, to do mitzvahs, go to shul, do all of those things, give charity with it, to salt away the money. And the most important thing, again, a person needs to know, we all need to make money. That's essential for life. In Kemach, in Torah. If there's no flower, there is no Torah. Make money. Don't let money make you. And that becomes a distinction. If a person remembers that, then you can use it for blessing and, not, and outsmart the, the, the side of evil as trying to use it in a negative way. God bless and be well. And again, may you all be successful. Have a great Shabbos.